Lecture 15, The Producer-Consumer Problem. Various textbooks introduce a few classical problems, and these are standard stock scenarios that are phrased in real-world terms, but they're meant to be an analogy for some of the problems that an operating system or any system really might deal with. These standard or classic problems are used to test any newly proposed synchronization or coordination scheme, uh, and we'll see that many programs that we want to write will resemble this sort of thing. All of the solutions to these problems make use of semaphores as a basis for mutual exclusion, uh, and there's three problems that we're going to look at in the most depth. There is the producers-consumers problem, there is the readers-writers problem, and there is the dining philosophers problem. Uh, the dining philosophers problem leads us into our topic of deadlock. If you'll recall, we had an informal definition of that previously, uh, and so we will eventually need to uh, make our way to a formal definition of it. Uh, but for now, uh, we will stick with the informal definition. Uh, as that should suffice. Um, but we, you know, Monty Python jokes aside, expect that we will consider these three problems in the most detail. There are additional problems that we will examine as well, but in less detail, because they are building upon what we already know from these. So we're going to start with the producer-consumer problem. This one is one of the most important ones. Um, if for no other reason, then you will probably find it in a lab exercise. This is called the bounded buffer problem in some books as well. Uh, and the defining characteristic is that uh, two processes share a common buffer, and the buffer is of fixed size. It can be quite small or large, but it is of fixed size, ultimately. And one process is the producer, that is it generates data and it puts data in the buffer. What does it mean to generate data? Well, it could really be anything. Um, it could be reading data from a file, it could be taking input from a user, it could be generating random numbers, it could be measuring a temperature outside. It doesn't matter very much as long as it makes something, it produces data. In a couple of contexts, and Java function pointers is one of them, the producer is sometimes called the supplier. Not a fan of the terminology, so I'm not going to use it here. Um, equivalent to the producer, nothing to, nothing to see there. The other kind of process is the consumer, and the consumer takes the data out of the buffer and it does something useful with it. Again, definition of useful is highly dependent on what the data is and where it's going. Uh, for, uh, for the sake of an example, if it's uh, data that's being read from a file, it might be uh, sending it uh, over the network. Um, consumers might be um, printing it to a printer, might be showing it to the user on a screen, something like that. As long as it is taking data out of the buffer and doing something useful with it, that makes it a consumer. Now, our problem can be generalized to have an arbitrary number of producers, an arbitrary number of consumers, uh, and in real life, most situations will probably resemble that at least a little bit. Um, but for now, just to keep it simple, we're going to start with just one of each, uh, and that will make it a little bit simpler, and then we can scale it up. So there are rules. There are always rules. Um, so number one is that we have a buffer and the buffer is of a fixed size and we'll just use a constant here, buffer size. That's fine. We cannot write into an empty, uh, into a full buffer. Uh, so there's no overwriting. If the buffer is full, it means a producer has to wait until there is some space so where it can put an item. Uh, and uh, similarly, a consumer cannot read from an empty buffer. If there's no data there, if there's zero elements in it, the consumer can't read, and it has to wait until there is something in the buffer. If the term buffer isn't super clear, for the purposes of illustration, you could imagine it as an array. Um, in some of the examples we'll do, the buffer is just an array of integers. Um, obviously, uh, not everything is integers, uh, and it doesn't have to be represented as an array. But that is uh, just a simple model for picturing it. Uh, and if the array is full, that is to say there's a number in each of the spaces uh, in the size of the array, then 
we can't put anything in there because it's full. We would be overwriting and that's not allowed. Similarly, if there's nothing in any of the spaces, uh, there's, there's no data in any of the spaces, then there's nothing to consume and the consumer has to wait. Okay, so imagine then that we have to keep track of the number of items in the buffer. That seems reasonable. We want to know if the buffer is full uh, and we want to know uh, if the buffer is empty. In principle, you could scan every position in the buffer to check and see if there's an element there, but that's really wasteful. Um, keeping track of the number of elements currently in the buffer seems like a less painful way to do this. So yeah, we should expect that there is a, a variable count which takes care of uh, the number of items in the buffer. Accordingly, we will need a mutex of some sort for it, such that we can you know, protect accesses to, um, to this count because the producer and consumer might be wanting to modify it at the same time. So if busy waiting is permitted, that is, we do not care even a little bit if we are wasting CPU time, your solution can have one mutex, uh, which in this pseudocode is just called mutex. Um, and um, you may imagine that um, each of the producer and the consumer very likely run in a loop, whether infinite or very large or just even moderate size, it doesn't really matter. Um, but we're showing the code for one iteration of the loop so that uh, it's not cluttered up with, uh, with too much. So the producer produces the item somehow again imagine this is generating a random number fine uh, and then added uh, is false while added is false wait on the mutex see if we can add the item to the buffer so if count is less than the uh, maximum size add the item to the buffer increment count set added to be true uh, and then that will break us out of the while loop and uh, we'll post on mutex before we do that for the consumer, set removed is false, and while removed is false, wait on the mutex. If count is greater than zero, take an item out of the buffer, decrement count. Uh, set removed is true, post on the mutex, we'll exit the loop if we were successful, and then consume the item. Okay, so like I said, this works if busy waiting is permitted, that is, it is allowed that we waste a whole bunch of time from the CPU, because if the buffer is empty, for example, the consumer spends a lot of time in the uh, in the while loop, waiting on the mutex, checking uh, is count greater than zero, no it isn't, okay, post on mutex, and then immediately wait on the mutex again to check yet again, has anything happened in the meantime? That's inefficient, and we shouldn't like that. We now you might also ask just looking at this you know add item in buffer um, that seems you know like a you know, euphemism for uh, something that is fairly hard you know, like uh, if, if somebody tells you you know well, how do you climb a mountain you're just like we'll just keep going up until you get to the top it's like well that's factually correct but it's not at all helpful uh, because it doesn't tell you about any of the details that would be necessary to do this successfully uh, but it depends what kind of structure you have um, you know if if your um, if your buffer in this case is an array, then you have to figure out what element index you want to write into the array. We're going to see that later. Um, but if your data structure is a queue or something, there might just be an NQ function, in which case you call that function. And you say, yeah, please enqueue this item in the buffer, please and thank you. Uh, and similarly, a DQ function. Uh, and so all the details are internal to the data structure and you don't have to manage it. So for that reason, uh, and to you know, keep the focus on where it should be, I just put in the square brackets, you know, a little magic that says add item to buffer. Great. Okay, now we've agreed, I think, uh, previous to that diversion, that we want to have um, some sort of non-busy waiting solution because this is inefficient uh, and we're just wasting a whole bunch of CPU time. So well, the behavior that we actually want is the producer gets blocked if there are no available spaces and the consumer gets blocked if there is nothing to consume. So, I mean, how do we go about that? Again, a brief opportunity to think about it before I suggest something. Now, if you're looking at a solution that says, you know, we have a counter for uh, for the number of items or, or we have some sort of trigger that, you know, if count is this, then that, those don't work 
quite as well as we would like um, because you know, we don't really have a good toolkit that says, you know, actually, please block this thread, do we? Or block this process. So what we actually need is to track the available spaces and items in the buffer uh, with something that gives us the ability to block a thread when we need it to. I'm given to understand incidentally this image comes from some telenovela where um, the, the lady is, is trying to uh, do some math when some other character has announced that she's pregnant and this character is trying to f figure out um, how far along in the pregnancy she or something like that. I don't know why it requires you know geometry and all this algebra for what is essentially an arithmetic problem, but I'm sure some graphic designer had a really fun day uh, doing the post-production on this shot. Anyway. Our solution is, of course, to use general semaphores. I say, of course, because, you know, if you're playing the metagame, you know, we've just spent a lot of time talking about semaphores and talking about them in, in synchronization patterns. Like, gee, whatever could we use in this situation? Why don't we use that thing that we have been learning about for the last couple of lectures? Um, but what's interesting and what's you know, helpful about this is, in this case, we're using the value of the semaphore itself as a kind of counter. Uh, it has an internal value and you can't really ask about its internal value, but its behavior is dependent on what that value is. You know, if it's negative and we decrement it, we get blocked, you know, that kind of thing. So we can actually use this to our advantage and we can use a semaphore to count. Uh, and for that reason, we will create two semaphores. Uh, each, uh, if, if your semaphore system, you know, not in Unix, but some of them do allow you to set a maximum value. Unix does not, but if it did, you would want the maximum value to be buffer size. Um, in our scenario, the maximum value will be buffer size. It's just you know, dependent on you to enforce that. Uh, and items will start at zero, represents the number of spaces in the buffer that are full. Uh, and spaces starts at buffer size and represents the number of spaces in the buffer that are currently empty. Uh, again, I hope that is reasonably sensible in your mind because, of course, at the beginning of time when we create everything, the buffer should be empty to begin with. Uh, if for some reason you are resuming a program that has partial state, and you know, oh, there were 10 items saved in the buffer, then obviously you start items and spaces adjusted by this factor accordingly. But... At the beginning of time, normally items is zero and spaces is however many spaces there are in the buffer. Very good. Okay, then uh, we're going to do this, producer consumer with waiting. So the producer will produce an item, wait on the semaphore spaces, add an item to the buffer, and then post indicating that there is an item by posting on the items semaphore. The consumer waits for there to be items remove an item from the buffer, post on spaces, and then consume the item. So I have two questions, and we'll start with the first one, which is, does this work? Maybe I should um, look into uh, getting some of that you know, royalty-free music to play in the little thinking pauses. You know, not, not quite the Jeopardy theme because that's probably copyrighted and I can't use it, but just like a little thing so you know that you know, this is think time as opposed to just like, did the sound stop working? You know, did, did my headphones die? Um, is this an editing mistake? Okay. Um, does this work? Yeah. Uh, there's really not a lot that could go wrong here. Uh, our, our situation is balanced in terms of wait and post statements, and there's not a lot of complexity to what's going on. The synchronization code is straightforward. The only thing you really have to ask yourself is, do our initial conditions make sense? So you know, does it make sense for items to start out at uh, zero and for spaces to start out at buffer size? And you can look at that and you can say, yeah, uh, because if the consumer runs first uh, and it tries to wait on items, well, the consumer gets blocked because there are no items because no producer has had a chance yet. So that makes a certain amount of sense. And accordingly, when the producer wants to run, well, if there's tons of spaces, then yeah, it should be able to proceed immediately. Uh, and so you might be 
uh, thinking about this you know, when it seems so simple in terms of the edge cases. So, you know, what are good edge cases for this? One is what happens at the beginning of time or, you know, or when the buffer is empty. Uh, the other one you might think about is what happens when the buffer is full. Uh, and when the buffer is full, you should expect the mirror image behavior. The producer waits on spaces and gets blocked uh, and therefore can't continue. But the consumer uh, will not get blocked and waiting on items because that's no big deal. There are lots of items. It will get one. Okay, so on to the second question. Uh, and that is, are there any implicit assumptions? Of course, it occurs to me that uh, you know, if you wanted more time to think about it, you could always pause the video, but I do still leave a, a little gap in case that's inconvenient. Um, so are there implicit assumptions? Yeah, there's a couple of them. One is that there exists a concept uh, of adding an item to the buffer you know, in the next available space, which we talked about earlier, uh, and also same for removing, that there has to be a concept of uh, taking the next item out of the buffer uh, and making sure that you know there's, there's no conflict there. Um, if we have two producers, for for example, we might you know have them both trying to write into the same space at the same time, and that would be a problem. So our current situation allows us to have only one, but that's okay. We said in the beginning that there is no issue. Um, one of the things that you might be concerned about, though, is what happens if the producer and the consumer are both looking at the same space. You know, if they each have a concept of next. What if both of their you know, next is the same location? So I'll let you think about that as well. If it helps you to visualize it, imagine that we have an array, uh, and the array, for the sake of this purpose, uh, is six elements in size. Uh, and the producer and the consumer, uh, both both of them are looking at space four. Under other circumstances, I might have drawn this on a on a chalkboard or whiteboard, but here we are. Right, so I think you will agree with me when I say that there's no problem even if the producer and the consumer are looking at the same space. Why? Either there is an item there or there is not. If there is no item there, then the consumer can't run. That means that you know, everything is basically full. Uh, and so there's nothing else for the consumer to consume. And it's looking at space four because that's you know, the next one. Uh, but all previous items have been consumed and because there's nothing there the consumer will be blocked and the producer is able to produce and put something there alternatively it could be the other scenario that there is something there and the consumer will be able to run because it can take it uh, but the producer would not be able to because that space is currently full and this applies to any space in, in any size buffer. If, you know, if there's something there, the producer can't put it there. If there's nothing there, the consumer can't take it. And if they're both looking at the same space, it means effectively either the buffer is full or empty. Uh, but whatever space a uh, thread is looking at, it can only proceed if there's something there that it can use, either a space or an item. And uh, if they're both looking at the same space, only one of the two threads can take action because a, an element of the array is either filled or not filled. It's either a space or an item. It can't be anything in between, you know, no half and half. Can't have half an item. So that'll work. Now suppose that I wanted to take this to be multiple producers and multiple consumers. Well, then there's the possibility that two producers are thinking about the same location. So we should uh, prevent that. Let's try this then. So the producer uh, produces the item, waits for there to be a space, wait on the mutex, add an item to the buffer, post on mutex, post on items. Consumer waits for there to be items, wait on mutex, remove an item from the buffer, post on mutex, post on spaces, and then consume the item. 
Um, we do have to, of course, choose an initial value for mutex. I'll, I'll give you this one. It's one. Uh, and does this, you know, does this do what we expect it to do? Does it work? Do you see anything worrying? Yes, we have nested weights. Both the producer and the consumer, incidentally, have nested weights. Uh, the producer's nested weights are line two and three, and the consumer's uh, are one and two. Um, but those are concerning. Uh, and as before, this should set off some alarm bells for you. You should say this is potentially a problem. We should, however, be able to reason through why there is or is not a problem in this scenario. So going back to the pseudocode, um, as before, if there is a problem, then you know, to demonstrate that there is one, all you have to do is come up with a sequence of statements where you say, well, if this happens, then that, then this third thing, then the fourth thing, we end up with a deadlock. Proving that it's not is harder. What, again, we did when we talked about synchronization patterns, I think, applies here, which is like start with there is a problem and work backwards. So if uh, the scenario is, well, uh, potential deadlock because we have nested weights, uh, for the producer, let's say, then let's figure out how does that happen. All right, um, th this is by no means a substitute for a formal mathematical proof. You know, somewhere a math prof is crying uh, as a result of this, but you know, if you are, um, if you are unable to come up with a scenario that causes a deadlock by sort of working backwards, then there might not be one. So, so you know, um, might want to check with someone to double check if it's not an exam situation. But let's let's start with a producer. So, okay, we're imagining that uh, a potential deadlock could occur uh, if we get blocked on the inner weight. So we are the, on the producer uh, and we get blocked on mutex. Okay, why does that happen? Well, it's because some other thread has uh, locked this mutex. Some other thread has successfully waited on it. If that's the case, there are two possibilities. Possibility one is it's a producer, and possibility two is that it is a consumer. So if it is a producer, well, another producer that has successfully locked the mutex is on step four, add item to buffer, and then it will post on the mutex. Add item to the buffer could take some amount of time, not necessarily instant, but it's not forever. Uh, and there's no conditional path where we fail to get to the post mutex statement. So if producer one is waiting for producer two at that location, then that situation will resolve itself because producer two will get to the post mutex statement on line five. If producer one is waiting on a consumer uh, that successfully locked the mutex, well, Let's go over there, uh, and we'll see again. A, any consumer that has successfully locked that mutex will be at statement three, removing the item from the buffer. As before, there is no conditional, there's no other weight, there's nothing like that. We will eventually get to a post mutex statement uh, in the consumer, and that will unblock the producer one. Okay, so that wouldn't be a problem. Uh, and you can make the very same argument, just mirror it a little bit for the consumer, uh, again, where you know, we would potentially get blocked uh, on the uh, inner weight, on weight mutex, but again, the only way we get blocked there is if another producer or another consumer has already gotten that mutex, in which case it's only a matter of time before it is released. So that being the case, um, we can, we can conclude, you know, again, not formally mathematically proved, but we can conclude that there is no problem with having these nested weights. As I've said before, it's a sign that something might be wrong, but it's not a guarantee of a problem. However, um, it could go the other way. So in this case, now producer produces an item, wait on the mutex, wait for space, add the item to the buffer, post on items, post on mutex, and the consumer waits on the mutex, wait for items, remove an item from the buffer, post spaces, post mutex, and consume the item. How about this? Is this better or worse? 
it's not very much different. It's just, you know, we swap the order of the weight statements. Okay, so you may have figured out that this is a problem, uh, and yeah, it is. Uh, we could examine either the producer or the consumer first. We'll start with the producer. Again, work backwards from assume there is a problem, so let's say that we get block waiting for spaces. How does that happen? Well, that means that the buffer is full. Okay, if the buffer is full, what does that mean uh, about consumers. Well, you know, a consumer that tries to run at this point can't because the consumer will get blocked at the wait mutex statement, statement one, uh, because the producer that is currently at its step three acquired the mutex in producer step two. So if the buffer is full and a producer wants to run, the producer gets stuck uh, and no consumer can ever run to bail anybody out. So that is a deadlock problem. That, that would prove that it's uh, not going to work. You might have thought of uh, the opposite one, which is what if the consumer gets stuck? Uh, and the consumer could get stuck actually if it runs first uh, just the beginning of time because the consumer's problem happens when the buffer is empty. Uh, it will wait on the mutex, wait for items, get blocked, uh, and then because it's holding on to the mutex and waiting for there to be items, no producer ever gets a chance to actually produce any items. So we have a deadlock there as well. Both the producer and the consumer are stuck. Uh, and the consumer situation could happen at the beginning of time, you know, when the consumer thread is created and the producer thread is created. Or it could happen anytime the buffer is empty, uh, or it could happen. Uh, it could happen uh, for the producer anytime the buffer is full. So yeah, that's not cool. That's not cool. Uh, again, if I asked you what's wrong with this and you came up with only one of the two solutions, that's fine. There's no reason why you have to come up with both once you've already found proof that it doesn't work. That is sufficient. Um, now. The problem, of course, with this kind of concurrency issue is that a problem is only sometimes a problem. If you implemented the pseudocode, so you actually you know, turned it into regular code and you ran it, you would probably find that it works okay most of the time. Once, however, we found you know, that this scenario could happen, you know, whether it's by just sort of looking at the code and saying, I don't think this is good, or you've observed the behavior at runtime, you know that there's a problem and you need to address it uh, and you don't necessarily have to look for other failure cases. You could say this solution isn't good and I need to replace it with a better solution uh, to actually proceed. Now, you know, there are lots of such problems that really are only encountered at runtime and nobody really notices them. Uh, and it's tempting uh, and some people have... Uh, have asked sort of in in piazza questions or similar you know well my program works you know 95 percent of the time isn't that enough uh, well no as we've been over before you, know, you wouldn't buy a pocket calculator if it gave you the wrong answer even one percent of the time uh, and similarly you know, as as much as uh, computers might be frustrating and what have you uh, it doesn't mean we should lower our standards and say, well, you know, sometimes Windows crashes, so I guess it's okay if my program crashes. So I don't even think Microsoft really takes that attitude anymore. You know, it doesn't matter. We made our money. Uh, is isn't, uh, isn't sustainable for them. So, yeah, we should obviously replace a solution that has a failure case with a better one. Okay, so now we're ready to look at a simple example. Um, we're going to analyze the solution uh, and see how we got from the pseudocode to the actual code. Uh, and then after we finish that, we are going to take this over to the multiple producers, multiple consumers scenario. Up top, we have all of our usual header includes. Uh, those are the, the standard ones, and we have semaphore.h, uh, which of course is necessary to work with semaphores. Now, uh, I have used a defined directive to say buffer size is 20. Uh, 
there's no reason why that's any sort of magic number. It just makes for uh, any uh, any example number is fine. Uh, so we declare two semaphores, spaces, and items. They're not initialized here because we have to use a, the seminit function to initialize them. Uh, we'll initialize counter to zero and buffer uh, will be our array. Uh, in this case, uh, that's the perfectly fine implementation. Speaking of perfectly fine implementations, the produce and consume functions uh, are provided. In this case, uh, produce uh, increments, counter, and returns that value. Sure, doesn't have to do anything interesting, could generate a random number for all it matters. Uh, and consume just prints a provided value out to the console, which is a perfectly valid way of consuming the data uh, and just shows you what's actually going on. Okay, uh, and then we have our code for the producer and consumer functions themselves. They're going to be run in pthreads, hence uh, the signatures of void star uh, return type and uh, void star argument. Uh, and the producer will count up to 10,000, or produce 10,000 items, put it in the buffer. Uh, and the consumer will also count up to 10,000 items, put it in the buffer as well. Now, the... Uh, Producer code we'll start with uh, starts out with p index is zero. This is how we're going to keep track of where we are in the array. Uh, we'll start out at array index zero. We'll increment it and then we'll just wrap around when we get to the end. So while we have produced fewer than 10,000 items, we produce an item, wait for there to be a space. Uh, then when there is a space, we can uh, proceed to buffer at a producer index is assigned this new value V. Um, it is important to remember that assignment statement in this context is copy. Um, this can this can get kind of confusing because like with integers and what have you, some of these details don't matter very much. But if you have a structure and you're doing an assignment statement, it's copying that's happening. Like V doesn't go away. It doesn't go out of scope. You know, it's nothing like that. Uh, and so what we're actually doing is copying the data into the buffer. If you're working with a struct uh, and you did an assignment statement, it would be a copy. Uh, if you wanted you know, to put a pointer in there, that would make a certain amount of sense as well. Um, in any case, the, the next step increments the producer index modulo buffer size. Uh, if you don't remember modulus, this is the remainder operator. Uh, you know, remainder in the sense of uh, when you were in elementary school and you were learning uh, about how to, uh, how to do division, you might have said, well, you know, 14 divided by 10 is one remainder four. Right, that that is uh, the modulus operator. It gives you four as the answer, uh, and so it wraps around the buffer size here. So when p index gets to be twenty one modulo, uh, so when it gets to be twenty modulo buffer size, then you know it wraps around and it becomes zero. Uh, and then we post an item. Once we finished uh, producing all the items, then p thread exit. Great. Consumer is not super different either. Um, you know, the uh, C index and C total here are, uh, are initialized and we will uh, keep track of how many items we have consumed uh, in this case. Uh, and uh, while C total is less than 10,000, wait for there to be an item. Uh, int temp is assigned buffer at C index, so copy from the buffer uh, into temp. The next statement, buffer at C index is assigned negative one, is actually totally unnecessary. Uh, it is, however, a little nicety that's in there because if you were running this code and you wanted to see what is the current state of the buffer, it would help you to see how many spaces are currently filled and how many currently have, you know, have been cleared out by uh, something being consumed. In uh, runtime, uh, when you actually produce and consume the items, you should never see negative one. If you did, something is wrong. And you're uh, accounting through uh, the use of semaphores and, and the uh, index values is somehow uh, out of order. But if you were debugging it and you wanted to see the current state of the buffer, then putting negative one is helpful because it allows you to visualize that. If you look at that memory and you see there's a bunch of minus ones in there, you know, okay, the buffer is mostly empty, something like that. Um, I don't think I mentioned this in the uh, introduction to uh, C, which I probably should have. Um, that's uh, 
something that I should have mentioned if I didn't, it's that you should uh, keep in mind that in a language like Java, null and zero are distinct. Null indicates a lack of a value, and zero is a number. Uh, in C, the constant null in, in capital letters, as is written here in this pthread exit null thing, is uh, zero cast to a void pointer. So if you're trying to use null as a sentinel value in your uh, in your array or in your structure or something like that, you have to make sure that zero is not itself a valid value. Uh, and in this case, because we're dealing with integers, zero is potentially a valid value. I mean, if we go back to... Um, previous one counter um, starts at zero so zero is valid so it wouldn't make sense to use null which will end up being zero as your sentinel or indicating an empty space for that reason we use negative one okay the consumer index uh, is then incremented you know c index plus one modulo buffer size post on spaces and then consume temp and then increment the total that has been consumed um, we've shown you know, a, a little bit of good behavior here where uh, produce happens uh, before we do the sem wait because we don't want to hold on to resources for longer than is necessary. Uh, and so the same thing with actually consuming it. Um, if you wanted to call consume without the use of the temporary variable, then it would have to be uh, sooner. Uh, otherwise, uh, we, the sem post here indicates the space and that space could get overwritten uh, before we got to the data. Therefore, it does make a certain amount of sense to copy the data uh, from the buffer to our temporary variable uh, and then use that temporary variable, right? Consume in this case is, I mean, not super cheap. Uh, printing to the console is somewhat expensive, uh, but it's also not a very long running operation. Uh, and so it doesn't matter all that much if it happens you know, in, in a section that's keeping other threads waiting. But more polite is copying the data that you need and then uh, consuming it later when you're not holding anybody else up. So, okay, that is a fully uh, working-ish uh, implementation of the producer and the consumer, as long as we only have one of each. Uh, and then, there, of course, there is a supporting main function to put all of the pieces together. So the main function uh, really doesn't do anything we've not covered before. Uh, it allocates a buffer. Uh, and uh, initializes all of the spaces in the buffer to be negative one. As I mentioned previously, memset is not a good choice for this because memset tries to assign every byte, uh, and an integer is more than one byte. So uh, we can't actually memset that very easily. We have to use, uh, have to use our for loop for this as per usual. Uh, we will initialize our semaphores, spaces. Uh, it will be created... Um, not shared because this is a single a single process program with multiple threads uh, and its initial value will be buffer size items not shared uh, initial value of zero those values if you need to go back and double check you know, square with what we discussed earlier when we talked about uh, how you should initialize them so those are correct uh, we didn't uh, get those backwards or anything We'll declare uh, two pthread t structures, one for the producer and one for the consumer, uh, and then we will pthread create them with default arguments uh, and uh, sort of def default attributes and empty arguments, uh, and then we will join both of those. When we're done, we can deallocate the buffer, we can destroy our semaphores, and then main can exit. At this point, we could return zero instead of pthread exit, but why not? Okay. So it's my hope that this code example was reasonably comprehensible uh, as an actual implementation of the single-threaded producer-consumer uh, problem. Now, before we go on to the next example, uh, we need to take a minute to learn about the syntax of the mutex. The hour of the hammer is upon us. So while it's possible to use the semaphore as a mutex, and you know, we could actually implement the, the upcoming example without using the mutex type at all, we would actually sometimes like to use the more specialized tool for the task. So while the semaphore is really quite general uh, and quite useful for lots of scenarios, most of the time actually using the more specialized tool is probably the better choice uh, because, well, that's what it's good at. That's what it's good for.
So the structure representing a mutex is of p-thread mutex t, and it is of course defined in the p-thread header, as you would expect. This is another one of those structures where the internals are completely opaque to us. We have no idea what its internals are like or why, uh, and it doesn't matter. Uh, all that is necessary is that we need to know whether the mutex is locked or unlocked, and that's pretty straightforward. So there are two ways to initialize a mutex. One is with the pthread mutex init function. It takes a pointer to the mutex that you want to initialize and a pointer to the attributes structure. You may safely assume in this case that attributes are null. Uh, that is always sufficient. Uh, and there is a static initializer. If you don't care about setting attributes uh, where you say pthread mutex t, my mutex is assigned, and then all in caps, pthread mutex initializer. This is a macro. Macros are uh, capable of being used for evil. I mean, the usual the uh, usual saying is that macros are evil, um, but they, they are capable of being used for evil, so we should be cautious with them. Uh, and this is just a syntactic shortcut. Um, I, I don't do it very often, I don't believe. Uh, much more likely is I call pthread mutex init uh, with mutex and then null for the attributes, uh, and that is sufficient. Now, when your mutex is created, it is by default unlocked. Um, so that's another way in which uh, this makes it a little bit superior to uh, actually using the uh, semaphore for this purpose, because with the semaphore, you have to choose explicitly which uh, initial value you want, and it's possible to choose wrong. Uh, for, the, uh, for the mutex, it's always created unlocked. So... That's good. There are three methods related to lock and unlock which are worth talking about. Okay, unlock I think is self-explanatory given a locked mutex. It unlocks the mutex. Sure, um, I can't think of anything to add to that. Uh, and then there are two kinds of lock. There's pthread mutex lock and pthread mutex try lock. The pthread mutex lock function call is blocking uh, and try lock is non-blocking. The lock function works as you would expect. If the mutex is currently locked, the calling thread is blocked until its turn to enter the critical section. If the mutex is unlocked, then it changes to being locked and the current thread enters the critical section. Try lock is more complicated uh, and is not necessary for understanding the example. I just didn't want to leave it off from here, you know, keeping all of the uh, keeping all the relevant things together. Um, we will revisit it when we look at another classical synchronization problem, uh, and we will see why try lock exists and why it is useful. Uh, and it is quite useful. Uh, and destroy is also self-explanatory. It's very similar to what we've seen with semaphore. Uh, that if you want to destroy a mutex, you just give it a pointer, uh, and that's what you do. Uh, an attempt to destroy the mutex might fail if the mutex is currently locked. Uh, for obvious reasons, it should only be possible to destroy something that's not currently in use, and if it is in, uh, in use, then this should not succeed. Uh you get undefined behavior if you attempt this. Undefined behavior is in the words of the internet, the worst thing ever. Cute comic book guy. It means that code that you write might work okay in development, but it'll break later uh, you know, when something else has changed, or just you know, generally speaking, something is uh, unreliable or you know, behaves strangely. Um, unfortunately, uh, the specifications for C and POSIX and what have you have a lot of undefined behavior situations, uh, and it causes programmers everywhere a great deal of stress and difficulty. Uh, like, for example, um, even reading from an uninitialized variable in C, that produces undefined behavior as well, because the specification is silent on what should happen in that case. Um, other languages, you know, invented more recently, uh, have answers to that. And you know, for Java, it is there's no such thing as an uninitialized variable. A variable is always initialized you know, to some default value. You know, zero if it's an integer, you know, null if it's a reference, something like that. 
Um, same thing for reading off the end of an array, undefined behavior. Uh, and those things are all implementation specific, so you maybe get away with it, maybe you don't. So attempting to destroy a locked mutex is bad, don't do it, uh, and uh, you will avoid the problem. But okay, uh, you know, he didn't, uh, didn't come to this to hear me rant about you know, the specif language specification of something from 1975. Uh, or 1990 in the case of POSIX. Uh, so the next example that we're going to do is based on the idea of having multiple producers and multiple consumers. So we're going to try to parallelize that solution uh, and uh, see, uh, parallelize the solution we saw earlier uh, and see what it actually looks like. Right, so uh, I've already prepared the uh, multi uh, multi-producer, multi-consumer version of this, so you don't have to watch me type it. Uh, but we'll go over a couple of things that are uh, that are noteworthy about this. So I've pumped up the buffer size to be a hundred, uh, just makes it a little bit uh, a little bit more interesting in terms of its actual execution. Um, and uh, so we've got all of our previous headers. Um, unlike the previous example, now instead of incrementing a counter, we generate a random number. So there is a math.h header included here. Um, so buffer size is 100. Uh, we allocate the buffer actually here as global memory instead of, uh, instead of being uh, allocated in main. Doesn't matter for uh, a size of 100, but uh, I suppose it's not great practice, so we could probably fix that as we go about it. Producer index and consumer index are shared, and they're going to start at zero. Uh, we have a semaphore for spaces. We have a semaphore for items. Uh, and we have our mutex, and here I have an integer uh, seed, uh, which is needed for the random number. Uh, there is a rand function, uh, which just generates a random number, but it is not thread safe because it uses some hidden state that's modified on each call. Uh, and so you uh, could end up with some weird, strange behavior. Um, if you actually want uh, random numbers in a, uh, in a multi-threaded program where rand is called from more than one thread, then you have to use rand r. Uh, and that's all actually detailed uh, in the uh, manual page uh, for this. So, um, yep, that's one of those. So just keep your uh, eyes open for this and, uh, and you will not uh, make this mistake. So anyway, um, the produce function generates a random number given a pointer to the uh, random number seed, which allows you to, because it's pseudo-random numbers, have reasonably reproducible results. Uh, and uh, we have a printf here that says the producer, whichever thread ID it was, produce this. Uh, and, and that will help us when we look at the output to figure out what does it look like at runtime? Like what process, uh, what threads are running in the process, and how does that actually work? Uh, and the same is true for consumer. Uh, there is a consume function uh, where it says printf consumer this consumed uh, this number. Uh, again, allowing us a little bit of insight into what's actually happening when the consumers are running. We'll look at the producer code first. So the way that this is written, uh, each producer is going to produce 10,000 items. Uh, so the, uh, we will uh, take the argument here uh, as our ID because we're going to uh, tell each uh, we're going to tell each thread this is your ID uh, and uh, so for in i equals zero i less than ten thousand plus plus i uh, produce uh, a new item then wait for there to be space lock the mutex put it in the buffer uh, increment our uh, counter with wrap around. Uh, and then unlock. Uh, and you'll notice that all the p index stuff is within the mutex uh, because, of course, p index could be manipulated by more than one thread. Uh, and when we're done, we'll just deallocate the argument and we're done. Consumer is very similar as well. Uh, again, each consumer will consume 10,000 items, uh, wait for there to be an item, lock the mutex, uh, copy the data out of the buffer into this temporary num variable, uh, set the buffer at C index to be negative one, uh, increment C index modulo buffer size, then uh, unlock the mutex post uh, spaces and then consume the item. Uh, and again, we'll free our ID uh, and exit. Uh, 
Uh, and then the main code looks like this. Uh, we will uh, init our semaphore spaces. Again, is not shared, but has buffer size uh, as its initial value. Uh, items, again, not shared and has zero as its uh, initial value. And then we have pthread mutex init. Uh, of our mutex, a pointer is required to the global variable mutex, so we do address of, and then null for default attributes. We're going to declare 20 threads. Uh, 10 of them will be producers and 10 of them will be consumers. Each producer makes 10,000 items, each consumer makes 10,000 items. This is just a simplification. Uh, and uh, in reality, you might uh, choose something different. You don't always want to have an equal number of producers and consumers. You might say, well, I, I only need five producers, but I need 50 consumers. Uh, or you might need 12 consumers and eight producers. It doesn't matter. Uh, and you might also not want work to be divided in such a way that every consumer consumes an equal number of items. You just maybe want whoever gets there first consumes the item that makes it uh, a little bit um, a little bit more complicated to figure out when we're actually finished uh, and so for that reason we've left it out I mean it's totally possible when you cancel threads to say yeah uh, I got the last item so everybody else can go home but for the purposes of keeping this example to be moderate in size uh, I have decided to just sort of leave that for now and make it so every consumer gets 10,000 items and every producer makes 10,000. So uh, we will start off by creating the producers. It doesn't really matter if you create the producers or the consumers first. Um, so we will create them uh, for each uh, of the producers. We allocate a new integer. We assign the integer ID here and pass it as the argument. Uh, and uh, well, if I did this instead, Why would this be wrong? There's actually two good answers to that, but why would this be wrong? Okay, so one idea that might have come to you is that I only has scope within this for loop, so it will go out of scope when the for loop ends. Uh, which is not what you want when it's being referenced by another thread. But the more problematic one is that every thread is created with a pointer to the same variable i, and i is being changed as we iterate over the loop. Uh, and that means that uh, potentially, if none of the threads run until all of them are created, all of them will see i as its final value of 10. That's not what we asked for. That's not what we wanted. Uh, so we have to... Um, we have to not do that, and we have to allocate the memory as we do here. Now, the thing is that um, when we allocate memory like this inside the loop, on every iteration of the loop, um, ID is you know, overwritten by a new malloc, uh, and uh, we no longer have a reference to it here in main. But that's okay, because we provided a pointer as the argument in pthread create, uh, and as we see uh, up at line 54 uh, in the consumer, when we provide that uh, ID, then it gets deallocated there. Uh, and this is what I mean about there always needing to be a path from allocation to deallocation. Uh, when we do that correctly, then you know, it doesn't matter that main no longer can access that memory. That's fine. Uh, the route that it takes has been given over to a different thread uh, and that and then a different function and that's responsible for collecting it and cleaning it up okay uh, and then creating the uh, the consumers we actually start at uh, index 10 and count to 20 could could I have made two separate arrays for threads yes um, but you know then you just have a little more work to do in loop 3 where you join them your decision uh, but join all the threads uh, and then destroy the semaphores, destroy the mutex, and exit. Okay, so yeah, um, we've we've seen how to initialize a mutex at line 61. We have seen how to destroy a mutex uh, here at line 80. Uh, and if we go up a little bit into the uh, consumer code, uh, 
uh, we can see how to lock a mutex and how to unlock a mutex and all of it is very straightforward there's again like with the semaphore with weight and and post there's no screwing it up it takes exactly one parameter and you don't have to guess about what it is so let's actually run it let's actually run it uh Okay, um, it is very spammy to the console. Um, so actually, if I want to uh, redirect that so that I don't have to uh, deal with it in the console, I can do that. As I recall, this demonstration failed previously when I was trying to show that. Uh, and then we can look at output.txt. Uh, and the numbers themselves are about what you would expect. You know, producer runs for a while and you know, puts some things in the buffer. So produces these, puts them in the buffer. Uh, and uh, you'll notice, of course, that you know, this continues up to some point uh, and... Uh, Eventually, consumers have to start consuming, otherwise there's no more space in the buffer. Now, the order in which things get printed isn't necessarily the order in which they get uh, taken out of the buffer, because thread switches could occur in between you know, taking an item out of the buffer and uh, getting to the print statement. Um, but you'll notice, uh, especially sort of as we get down to the end, that uh, which threads run and when is not super predictable. You don't necessarily get you know, all threads, even though they're all created at the same time, uh, all taking their turns one after another. Uh, here at the end, as we approach... Uh, uh, these uh, last lines here, uh, you know, the consumer uh, consumer zero and consumer six were, uh, were apparently unlucky. Sorry, uh, producer six and consumer zero were unlucky. Uh, and so they're the ones here left at the end after all of the other ones have gone home. This kind of thing will happen. Um, and this is what I mean about it is not predictable uh, as to you know what's going to happen uh, in in this scenario. Uh, so you know, if uh, if I run the program again and produce a, a different file, uh, no, I didn't want to vim it. I wanted to produce it. Um, then we'll see that you know these things are different here at the end. Now it's you know, consumer zero here is still unlucky, but now it's producer three that is the last one. Uh, and as long as that's not any kind of error, and there's no ordering that is implied, nothing is wrong with that. But this is the kind of thing that I mean when I say you can't predict the order in which these threads are going to run. You will get you know different behavior from different runs of the program, and it's non-deterministic, but it's not bad. Uh, it is just the way that it is. Um, if you wanted to see, um, one of the fun things that we can always do is sort of intentional sabotage. Uh, and one of them is we could actually see what happens uh, if we you know, forget to lock things. And I'll, I'll make it so that uh, the producer and the consumer just don't bother with locking. You know, locks are uh, unnecessary. Tests are for cowards. Uh, and, and locks are unnecessary. So we will uh, just comment out these locks. You know, who needs them? Just slow our program down. Okay, let's try that. And we'll just okay. Um, we will potentially find some strange things if we uh, scroll around a bit. Which is easier when we open it in an editor. Okay. Yep. Uh, there we go. There's uh, there's an easy to spot instance of a problem. Consumer consumed a negative number. <laughs> that shouldn't happen. You know, we we didn't have a uh, we didn't have proper coordination between who was producing where and who was consuming where. So consumer eight here at, at line three hundred and seventy six consumed a negative number. That is to say, it consumed a space that contained nothing. Uh, we'll we'll see that happens uh, actually several times uh, 
throughout the program. Uh, and that's just an easy way to spot that something is horribly wrong uh, whenever we see negative one because we didn't coordinate properly between all of the producers and the consumers. So that's not good. Uh, we should uh, try to avoid that. Uh, I don't know exactly how many uh, we will find, but we've already found a lot, and we're only you know, 11,000 lines into the program, uh, and uh, there's 200,000 lines. So, yeah, uh, I mean, this suggests that some items are getting lost or overwritten or consumers are consuming at the wrong time. You know, what exactly is going wrong is hard to debug in this scenario, and you know, just looking at the output doesn't really tell us anything. Uh, about how we got there. All we know is that something is wrong. We should not consume negative one. And it really didn't take long for that problem to appear. So, yeah. Uh, so, always a little bit fun to uh, sabotage a uh, program and, and see where it takes us. So, uh, this uh, wraps up our discussion, really, of the uh, producer-consumer problem. Um, we, I think, uh, got a, a pretty good idea about uh, what it's about and what it's for. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is featured in one of the labs. Now, uh, the version that's featured in the lab is, uh, is using um, processes instead of threads, so you can't just you know, take this example one-to-one -to, -one to that. But it should give you a... Uh, good understanding of the topic and the idea of producing and consuming and a hint about the importance of making sure that all of our uh, uh, all of our concurrency control is implemented correctly to ensure that nobody ends up reading negative one or you know, reading garbage or data getting lost so in our next video we're going to examine the uh, readers writers problem which is the second of our many uh, concurrency and uh, synchronization classical problems that we are going to examine. Uh, but we'll stop it here, and uh, I will see you at the next video.